Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ask the Doctor. We've been joking around in the back scenes here, so we've been having some fun, and we're ready to keep that going. So please write any questions you have in the chat for tonight. Um, we're, we can't wait to, to get that to you. We have an awesome topic tonight, Why You Can't Lose Weight, Weight Loss and Metabolism Mini Course, which I'm super excited to learn all about. So our amazing guest speaker teaches, lectures, and trains doctors all over the world. And tonight he's going to teach us, and then we can ask him as many questions as we can fit in. So without any further ado, the amazing Dr. Bob Rakowski. Well, Carol, thank you always. My favorite night of the week. I love sharing health information, and this is a really popular topic. You know, I, I can't even tell you how many messages I get, how many people come in person, they say, why can't I lose weight? What's different? Well, there's probably quite a few things different, and we'll unwind <laughs> the science tonight. So quite simply, we know that the old model is broken. So the old, old idea about calories in, calories out, and you know you keep a balance there and you're gonna be fine, but that doesn't work because there's a lot more to the game of weight loss than just what you're eating and how effectively you're burning it. And you know, we used to be certainly one of the fattest nations of, in the uh, universe, and that's still true in North America, we have challenges, but other people are catching up with us because we've shared some of the horrible food choices that we've created around the world. So now we have globesity where literally every country on planet earth suffers from malnutrition and the majority of them have a significant challenge with obesity. So I first saw this cartoon, I think it was about 25 years ago or animation or picture or graphic or whatever you want to call it. But you know, Michelangelo's David was the perfect man uh, and in the right, they said Michelangelo returns to Italy after his tour of the United States, thanks to our proud sponsors, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, uh, <clears throat> you know, whoever you want to sponsor, whoever your, your junk food vendor is. Uh, and realistically, food choices are a big part of it. So is the environmental toxins, so are the stressors, so is the fact that activity has been injured, uh, engineered out of daily activity. But it's not as easy, as I mentioned, as calories in, calories out. So we're going to talk about the food environment, the emotional state, the nutrient balance, the hormone levels, blood sugar levels. Those are all very, very important. Exercise is critical. Percent lean mass and fat mass, that also determines our metabolism. And then one that's gotten a lot of press over the last five years is gut bacteria. So when we look at the food environment, you know, I just saw this cartoon the other day and, you know, you see people that are actually putting stuff on our food wearing hazardous, you know, hazmat materials. And you might ask, well, wait a minute, they're spraying that on things we eat. How can that be wise? And, you know, people say, well, just wash it off. Well, it gets in the groundwater, it gets in the root system, it gets in the plants, uh, the animals eat uh, the plants and everybody is getting progressively intoxicated. And over the last decades, we've just used more and more and more herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. Uh, and again, these are poisons being sprayed on foods that we eat. <clears throat> so this was an article that was published a few decades ago and it asked the question, you know, are the chemical toxins the reason that we have a global obesity epidemic? And quite simply, here's what they said. Yeah, the data is right there. As you see the rising increase in environmental toxins, obesity matches that almost as an identical slope. So <clears throat> very, very, very bad choices. So a little bit of fancy language here, medical language, toxins disrupt mitochondrial function. Mitochondria are the powerhouses inside cells. They make 94.4% of human energy. That's where we convert fat into energy. So, you know, we actually do burn the fat. Uh, and there was a very nice TED talk. It said, when you burn the fat, where does it go? Well, believe it or not, it actually turns into carbon dioxide and water, but it takes energy and oxygen to make that, con you know, that conversion. So aerobic exercise with oxygen there, you burn it. If you don't have oxygen, if you don't have energy, you're not going to burn the fat. Now, when we start talking about processing foods, the food environment, and how satisfying the food is, very simple study says this, the more processed the food is, the less satisfying it is to your body and your brain. So here's what happens. You eat food that's processed and you're always hungry. 
Now that would be enough, you know, enough just by itself to try to avoid it. But then they throw in other types of chemicals that are actually designed to make the food addictive. Uh, and we're seeing it happen all over the place. And it's not just all these complete processed foods. They can take something really good like fruit and notice that it says, as the fruit is processed, it lowers its alkalizing effect. That's a major third, uh, step towards health. The antioxidant benefit, that's anti-aging. Uh, and then the satiotogenic. So it doesn't satisfy yourself anywhere near as much. So again, less processed is better. Michael Pollan wrote a fascinating book called In Defense of Food. And he said, you know, something strange started happening in the 1980s. He said, food started flying off the shelves of grocery stores and being replaced with food-like substances. He said, it may look like food, it may smell like food, it may taste like food, but it's not food, you know? So if you were to look at the shelf life of a delicious piece of cheese, how long is that gonna last? A few days, a week, you know, maybe, maybe a little longer in the refrigerator, but not much. And what about this? Well, they're calling it some type of cheese whiz or something like that, but a couple years, three years, maybe longer than that, because it's just completely artificial. So not a good idea. There's his book in defense of food, a very simple wisdom from him. I'm going to expand on it in just a moment, but he says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's a good start. Uh, and the way I tweak it is I say, eat real food, not the stuff that looks like food or food like eat clean food. That's getting harder and harder to get not too much and not too often. Calorie restriction and intermittent fasting are two phenomenally published methods of longevity. And in fact, there was a 2016 Nobel Prize in medicine showing that when you don't eat too much and you don't eat too often, your body clears out bad cells more efficiently, more effectively through a process called autophagy. Every color, every day, different variety of plants have different nutrients now in a way that honors your genetics. So by the way, if your ancestors ate that way, it's probably okay for you. If they didn't, you're, you're, it's probably not the right choice for you. Your physiology, what's your body going through right now? You know, if someone did a very intense day of physical exercise, they need more calories, they need more protein, they need more antioxidants. Same if you're suffering with some type of injury or illness. And then your body goals, you know, eat in a way that honors that. And again, mostly plants, why mostly plants? Well, I tell people that we're at the top of the food chain. We're bioconcentrators. We don't live on dirt, air, and water, but on lower level plants and animals that do. So as we go up the food chain, we concentrate the nutrients. Well, that's a good thing, but we also concentrate the toxins. And the way the world is right now, that's a bad thing. So now we're going to talk about emotional state. Uh, interesting study, three fourths of medical visits are in some form related to stress. So we live in a world where people are just profoundly stressed. And this study said nearly everybody walking around has too much stress for too long. And it creates a circumstance where they have something called cortisol resistance. Now, if I was going to give a technical article to or, or talk to doctors, I would tell them, we know that cortisol breaks down lean tissue, increases fat, by at least a dozen mechanisms. Uh, and that is not in the direction of good health. So fascinating study here. Uh, when people are stressed, they often do, they call it comfort eating. I'm gonna call it discomfort eating. And notice what it says. It didn't dampen the reactivity or enhance the recovery from their mental stressor. So food is not gonna be a good escape from anything that's stressful for you. And in fact, it usually makes the circumstance worse. So another study again, stress and pain can lead to discomfort eating and that type of eating leads to obesity and ill health. So instead of having you know, one problem or two problems, you now have many, many more problems because obesity puts you at risk for about everything. So for years, yeah, you know, I've been talking about now this stress reset. I have people take melatonin every waking hour, theanine every waking hour, ganoderma spores every waking hour to calm the body, the mind, and the spirit. Now, when we start looking at our physiology and our hormone levels, insulin says store fat, don't break down fat. That's going to be an important hormone. 
thyroid controls the metabolic rate of 99% uh, of the tissues of the body. The adrenals are going to make hormones. Those are the stress hormones. We talked about that to some degree. The gut will talk about, especially with the microbiome and the liver, because toxins impair our ability to burn fat. But when we eat processed foods, starchy foods, white foods, we spike insulin and insulin says store fat, don't break down fat. When we eat, you know, I call them leans, greens, nuts, and seeds, but they don't have to be leans. You can get really good fats. That's going to be an insulin friendly diet. And that's a great way to keep a lean body. And, you know, I'm a big promoter of Ganoderma because it actually reduces insulin resistance and body fat and actually unwinds a lot of the puzzle of obesity. When we start looking at hypothyroid, it's called the most environmentally sensitive gland in the body. Top cause of, of hypothyroid is actually autoimmunity, um, something called Hashimoto's disease. And interestingly enough, again, my favorite superfood has a positive effect on everything that causes hypothyroid. Another reference how chronic stress makes you fat. So that's another hormone called out here. And if we can eliminate toxins, which is, that's one thing I, I often do with patients, I'll put them on an intense detox diet and they lose more weight than they can imagine in a short period of time. They're suddenly efficiently their body turns into a fat burning machine. But the symptoms of chronic poisoning, you know, I, I, classically, they're published as fatigue, sleep disturbance, intestinal distress, allergy symptoms, headaches, confusion, and anxiety. But some of the other things that they're going to bring out are going to be skin problems, skin eruptions, body odor, constipation, and weight gain. So we want to make sure we get rid of those toxins. When we start looking at exercise, it's pretty fascinating that even when people have a predisposition towards obesity, the phrase I like to use is that exercise turns on your skinny genes. So one year of a physically active lifestyle decreases the genes that cause obesity, their expression, turns down the dimmer switch on them about 40%. Well, what about two years? So you get another 40% and three, another 40% of that. And that's what appears to be the case. So if you're consistent with exercise, create a healthy, active lifestyle, you turn down your own obesity genes. And especially when you do things like weightlifting, you're basically going to build muscle, build bone, break down fat. Uh, and that's going to be really important for health and longevity. So we start looking at the lean to fat ratio. This is the cdc.gov. 42% of US adults are obese, 71% are overweight. This was a Mayo Clinic study. They looked at people around the world. And, and by the way, they called these things the top uh, healthy habits. So they said, if your diet was in the top 40%, which by the way, in my book, that would still be a terrible diet. I'd probably want you in the top 15, 20% of, of food choices. 150 minutes of exercise per week, if you were a non-smoker, uh, and then men, if you had a body fat less than 20%, women less than 30%, there was basically 97.3% of people that weren't able to meet these four criteria. And I've talked about the Magnificent Seven. You've got to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right. So how many people are doing that? And my answer is simple, not enough, and certainly far less than 2.7%. Are gut bugs making you fat? In some cases, they can be. And so this was a very unusual study, but it, it taught a really good point. So these were two identical human twins. Uh, they grew up in the same environment. One became obese, the other stayed lean. And they thought, all right, well, let's, let's see if the microbiome has an impact. So they did a fecal transplant. They took feces from the obese twin, put it in the backside of an identical twin mouse. They did the same thing with feces from the lean twin and inside the identical twin mouse's backside. And on the exact same diet, the exact same quantity, the exact same quality, the exact same timing, the mouse that got the obese microbiome became obese. Uh, and so we definitely wanna pay attention to our gut, our gut bugs. And interestingly enough, medically, they do something called a fecal transplant. It doesn't have to be that complex. Uh, at first I thought it was a ridiculous idea but I had a patient come to me and he said, Bob, my weight is really stubborn. I can't lose weight. You know, will you help me with a fecal transplant? I said, I haven't looked into that at all, but I know someone who has. 
So we got on a three-way call with one of my mentors that, that really pioneered fecal transplants. And here's what he told him. He said, get an all organic baby that has not been vaccinated, that's been exclusively breastfed, get a little bit of stool from the diaper, put it into a, a little saline solution, and then basically squirt that up your backside. Well, that was the only thing he did different. And in the next six months, he lost 60 pounds when his weight was very, very stubborn. So pretty fascinating how that can work. So what have I learned about nutrition and health and teaching all over the world? Well, it's actually very, very simple. The four criteria that people use for a food choice, number one, it's got to taste good. Number two, it's got to be convenient. Number three, they have to be able to afford it. And then number four, uh, their fourth criteria is health. You know, I'd like to move that much more up the list, but you know what, that's the way the world eats. But what if we could combine all those things, make things tasty, convenient, affordable, and healthy? And we've done that. We have a group called the Seven Day Transformational Challenge where they do shakes that taste like liquid birthday cake, healthy coffee, tea capsules, and they tend to melt off the fat. You know, Frank started with seven days. He liked it so much. He did it for 10 months. And at the end of 10 months, lost a hundred pounds, you know, and, and we have plenty of fantastic stories of people who have done that. So now we'll transition to see if anybody has any questions. Well, you know that they're going to, so let's get started, Dr. Bob. Uh, that was a lot of information again to take in. Uh, Grace asked, does gallbladder issue affect your breathing or can it affect your breathing? Well, it could. And, and so, you know, anytime you ask, could it, we have to get these things in the realm of possibility. But you, you've got this dome-shaped muscle called the diaphragm, and then you've got the liver and the gallbladder. And so if you irritate this enough, there's a potential inflammatory process that could affect the, the diaphragm. There could be a little bit of spasm. And so in theory, it could prevent to some degree diaphragm excursion. Um, you know, there's something called a gallbladder flush and it, it's fairly easy. I would encourage you to look it up on YouTube, Facebook, but you eat a basically non-fat diet for a week. There's certain herbs that we do to thin the bile. Uh, artichoke leaf extract is actually pretty good for that. Uh, and then after the gallbladder is calm, there's a reflex point near the gallbladder that it tends to be pretty tender when the gallbladder's uh, unhappy. When that's no longer tender and it appears that the gallbladder is not inflamed, people take anywhere from eight to 16 ounces of olive oil at bedtime. Uh, and the next night they're gonna wake up and you know the gallbladder stores and concentrates bile, that's what digests fat. That big burst of fat causes the gallbladder to, to dump. Uh, and I even have some interesting videos I could share of people that have passed some absolutely amazing stones. I mean, they, they, they'll actually, fish them out of the commode and bring them in. I, I tell them, you know, I'm fine with pictures or you can keep that to yourself, but you know, they're so amazed that they bring it in. Awesome. Um, Grace also asked, what are the best products or food types to help you poop right? As we talk about that a lot. Well, <clears throat> so the, the bowel function is fiber, water, and neurologic tone. Uh, and fiber is a plant substance. So when you eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, and by the way, you want to eat low glycemic index fruits. So that would rule out bananas and things like that. Dark type berries can be very, very good. Lots of salads. Uh, there's plenty of people that actually do a supplemental fiber. You know, there's psyllium and other forms like that. But I, I have to say over the last decade or so, there's so many really good fibers out there that I actually refer to fibers as one of my biohacks. You know, you can get a fiber that tastes like lemon or maybe even tastes like strawberry. And when you put hot water on it and you just let it sit for a couple of minutes, it becomes very gelatinous, you know, like a really strong pudding. And with that fiber, you eat it, you don't, you get almost zero calories. You might get five or 10 calories, absolutely negligible, but your stomach is suddenly very, very satisfied. And when that fiber goes through your system, it you know, it adds bulk to the stool. It's the stretch reflex of the colon that causes elimination. So as long as you have good fiber, good water, you're gonna move. My favorite form of magnesium uh, for bowel function is something called magnesium citrate. And, 
you know, people can start out with uh, just a couple hundred milligrams uh, or they could go, the pharmacies here will have a, like an eight ounce bottle of mag citrate uh, and you drink that, you're pretty much guaranteed to really eliminate and, and everything, you know? So if someone's really stuck, they can do that. But, uh, you know, a couple hundred extra milligrams of magnesium citrate with some extra fiber, better choices in fruit and vegetables, that can go a long way. Perfect. Rhonda would like to know, um, are there any testimonies about eye, improving eye health? Well, that's, that's a interesting question. I mean, in, in what way improving eye health? Are we talking about vision? Are we talking about glaucoma? Are we talking diabetic retinopathy? Cataract. Because we do have uh, diabetic retinopathy improving quite a bit. So when people are losing their sight due to uh, diabetes, that can be it. When you start looking at cranial pressure and, and you know sometimes sinus pressure backing up glaucoma, we've had some improvements there. But cataracts is basically oxidation of the lens. Uh, and I don't know of a way to reverse it. Prevention trumps cure. The good news is they've gotten so much better at, at surgeries. I have a number of patients just this last year. And in fact, one guy is 77 years old. Since he was 12, he, he wears almost like Coke bottle glasses. And um, yeah, I don't know if they call it monovision or whatever they call it, but literally he went for this lens implant and he sees 2020 without glasses for the first time since he was 12 years. So 65 years with very strong corrective lenses. Now he doesn't need them. That's amazing. Uh, so for a person already on in kidney failure and on dialysis, what pro Ganoderma products, perhaps ones that we, we like, um, would you recommend? Well, I'd probably do more than just Ganoderma. You want to be real kind with the kidneys and, and that's so challenging, but I'll, I'll tell a couple different stories. So far this year, I've had three patients that were pushed to the brink of, ke of uh, kidney failure by chemotherapy and they had to stop that. One was a 67 year old woman from South Dakota with breast cancer. Uh, and it was kind of a blessing in disguise because when she couldn't take chemo, she reached out to someone who connected her to me. We put her on a really good program. And guess what? Four months later, we normalized her kidney function. And interestingly enough, all of her cancer markers went to zero, no detectable cancer. So beyond phenomenal. Uh, a gentleman just 40 years old had a, a B cell lymphoma, which should be pretty manageable with chemotherapy. He's, he's in Houston, Texas. He went to the oncologist and they said, well, this is something we handle all the time. Five sessions of chemo and you should be done. Well, define done, because basically he was on the brink of, of kidney failure, needing dialysis, and his tumors didn't respond. Uh, and so the oncologist said, well, okay, didn't work. We're going to kill off all of your bone marrow and hope we can get you a, you know, a bone marrow donor stem cell and you know, try to see if we can preserve you. Well, the guy came in an absolute mess. It's been, I think, five months. We've optimized his kidney function. One of his big masses is 100% gone, and the second big mass is 41% reduced. And that's by PET scan. So, you know, interestingly enough, we asked the question if we're on cancer, how does cancer occur when the conditions are right for cancer? Those conditions are low oxygen, low nutrients, high acid, chronic inflammation, immune suppression, secondary to chronic distress. And we've got great protocols for all of that. Ketogenic diet, lots of Ganoderma, good probiotics, activated omega-3s, you know, things that we have seen work very, very well. So when people have something serious like that, they want a good team. So most of the cases of dialysis are actually people that have been uncontrolled diabetic for too long. And I, now <clears throat> I do have a patient where she was actually on a kidney transplant list. Uh, and within a year, we went her for, for she was spilling uh, thousands of units of protein in the urine to just traces of protein. So it's pretty amazing what we can turn around with the right program. But people will often ask me, you know, can Ganoderma help? Can you help? Well, my answer is about Ganoderma. I don't know if it'll help, but it sure won't hurt. And in terms of me, I don't know if I can help or not, but I'll try, you know, and I've seen some pretty fascinating miracles in, in my 30 years of doing this. Awesome. Um... Nicole says, good morning, Dr. Bob. Uh, Nicole from Belgium, trying to follow. 
Uh, followed the 10 day detox and now wondering what is the best diet or food to start with after the 10 days. Well, welcome Nicole. So I'm going to say, uh, you know, a, a ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting is, is a really good way to go. And, um, you know, I, I had actually were Facebook friends, but I'm looking at this picture of you, you look pretty healthy. So that looks like a really good start. So hopefully this gave you the jump start that you're looking for. And just be gentle as you bring foods back because your body, your digestive systems have a little bit of a break. And if I could teach people one thing, I'd teach them to listen to their body, but congratulations to you. I don't know if it's 1.30 in the morning in, in Belgium. I think that's probably what time it is. That's, that's pretty impressive that you're here. So happy, beautiful day. Okay, Laurel asks, how much olive oil before bed or what about using coconut oil instead? You know, it's interesting. Traditionally, it's been olive oil, but I think coconut oil could work, you know, just as long it's a as it's a fat. So uh, I'll leave that up to you to try it. You know, they go uh, different reports, different body sizes, anywhere from eight to 16 ounces. It's a, it's a lot to drink. Um, but when people do it, I mean, they have some phenomenal responses. Uh, I want to see if I can share a video. Yeah, I can. So interestingly enough, I was teaching and, and sometimes I, my mouth works faster or my brain works faster than my mouth or however that works. But I happened to be in uh, Los Angeles and I was teaching uh, about a gallbladder flush and there was actually a medical doctor in the audience, which is kind of rare because they don't usually go to natural type seminars. And so I showed this video of this guy that was actually on a liver transplant list progressing towards liver failure. And it all turned around uh, with our program and with a gallbladder flush. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share the story. So when you see Jim, you know, Jim said, look, I, I know so I passed something and it was about this big and, you know, maybe, you know, three fourths the size of a golf ball. And uh, this, this flight surgeon, you know, medical doctor in, in the 10th row on the right stands up and says, all right, I'm calling BS. He says, I'm a, I'm a general surgeon. I've removed a thousand gallbladders. There's no way you can tell me that something this big can pass through a hole that big, like, you know, the size of a golf ball going through a pinky. And this is where my brain got me in trouble. I looked at him. I said, how big is a baby, you know? And almost everybody in the audience, you know, laughed hysterically thinking, well, that's a good point. Well, I didn't want to belittle the guy, but we've seen plenty of people pass some amazing stuff. So here's Jim telling his story. Okay, we are rolling. It's March 2nd of 2006. I've got Jim Thornhill here. Jim, uh, you came in in mid-January of this year. And what was your concern at that point in time? Well, I'd been diagnosed with, diagnosed with a, a liver condition that was going to end up telling me my liver was failing and at some point I was going to have to have a liver transplant. Um, I was losing weight. I was pretty ill, weak, and tired. Okay. Now, um, you gained some weight this time. Yeah, I gained 11 pounds. Are you, are you worried about that? Um, I'm, you know, I don't want to get any heavier, but, I, but no, I, I think I gained some muscle tone, tone, tone back and, and I, I feel better. Yeah, you actually gained 4.7 pounds of muscle. You gained a pound of fat and you actually have three liters more of fluid, two liters more inside the cell, one liter outside. And by the way, very healthy people, their ratio is two thirds of the fluid inside, one third outside. So your body made a very, very healthy fluid shift. How's your day-to-day -day activity changed? Um, it's, it's much better. I was, I was I'm a pretty active person in the afternoon. I was looking, I needed, I needed a nap. I couldn't get enough sleep. And now I, I still need to get a good night's rest and I'm tired at night, but I, I can work all day. On a scale of zero to 100, zero, no change, 100, perfect, ideal, your old self in six weeks, how much better are you? Uh, I'd say only 50. Nice, nice change. How difficult has this program been for you? Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge just because of travel, but other than that, I, I think I've been, I've done pretty well. I think I'm probably 85, 90% staying right with it. And, and it's been pretty easy. Now you did a, a liver gallbladder flush. Correct. And you think you passed something. 
I, I know I know I passed something. I'm doing this this question. I've been doing it like once a month, and then I, I I did it two weeks ago, and I passed probably eight to ten stones or about the, some of the fingers now. about the size of a small marble. And I, I don't think I don't know whether they're stones or not, but they're they're a green substance, very dense, and and uh, I, I something came out of my body. <laughs> Okay, you, you had some pain in your side before. Yeah. Where was your pain? Uh, right under my rib cage, the, in, in the, around the front. It's like a constant stitch or cramp. It's pretty much gone. Okay, pretty much. So on a scale of zero to 100, zero, none of it remaining, and 100 being full blown, really aggravating. Uh, probably about 80% gone. 80 percent gone so it's down to it yeah okay i'm down to a 20 of what yeah. was left before i mean i don't get it now until now it's i mean i don't have it right now it's gone and i was constant before okay that's fantastic um do you have advice for future patients try it i, I mean i came in looking for an alternative because i didn't like the prognosis that i had and it's, it's worth taking a shot okay do I have your permission to share this information with doctors, students, and patients everywhere? Sure. Any conditions on that? Absolutely. No, no conditions. Thank you so much. So I'm going to pause that. You know, actually, it's over. But, you know, when I first saw Jim, he was jaundiced. Uh, and he was progressing towards liver failure. And they said, if you don't get a transplant, you're going to die. And guess what good nutrition can do in the right program? And, you know, he really felt that that gallbladder flush was a big part of his step towards recovery. So pretty fascinating stuff. That's awesome. Xavius asks, why do fingernails change to a grayish color and are there vitamins that keep nails healthy and normal color? Well, ask the doctor, finally stumped the doctor. You know, I, I can't say I know why they would change colors. I'm going to say something has to have changed, whether it's circulation or mineral content or, but I don't know the answer to that one. And so... Um, you know, if they're not moving in the right direction, then we have to figure out what's different. Um, you know, I see a lot of people that they go to nail salons and if they're not real particular, it's amazing the different quality of different places. I've seen people come up with some really unfun stuff happening to their fingernails. Uh, and so we have higher level nail salons where, where people actually have their own instruments and everything else. And I, I think that'd probably be a good idea, but um, you know, there's different things that happen to nails that are respond in response to poor oxygen. There's other things that happen in response to poor minerals, uh, but a grain, I, I don't know that one. Okay, um, Grace asks, is lactulose, PMS lactulose or Senecot any of them good to take or to help you go to the bathroom or not? You know, if you tolerate them and they work, they are, you know, so that that's one of the one of the challenges. So lactulose is going to stay in the bowel. You're not supposed to absorb that. They actually use that as part of a test for a leaky gut. Anytime you're going to add volume to the colon, you have a probability of, of creating elimination. Uh, and the, the Senna is a natural laxative. It's a little bit of a stimulatory one. Um, but you know, I, I tell people poop, right. Is very, very important. And if you're not going, you need to figure out why, and you need to fix that. And so, you know, increase fiber, water, neurologic tone, increase extra magnesium citrate if needed, guess what? You can go to the store and get a, a simple little disposable enema, uh, and just eliminate. It's very, very important. Perfect. Beatrice asks, how can you help with digestive fluids when you do not have a gallbladder anymore? So the gallbladder is not a life critical organ. It stores and concentrates bile. Bile works in fat digestion and it's made by the liver. Uh, and so ultimately you may be a little more aggravated on fatty meals. And so you just have to probably eat less fat during a meal but you can also get enzymes. And so the three major enzymes, proteases digest protein, lipases digest fat, amylases digest starches, and those are available. And by the way, I prefer when it comes to digestive enzymes, plant enzymes over animal enzymes, because plant enzymes tend to work over a broader range of pH. And most people that are having digestive challenges, they don't have the right pH of their gut. 
Okay. Pete asks, is there anything that can be done for end-stage renal failure? My friend is on dialysis three times a week and needs a kidney and a pancreas. Well, we got to figure out what's causing the problem there. If they're saying he needs a, pig, a kidney and a pancreas, you know, is it end-stage diabetes? Was it pancreatic cancer? It's probably end-stage diabetes. We have to do everything we can to make that sugar work better. And so we've had plenty of cases, but uh, you don't want to get to the point of, of no return. You know, can we revitalize the kidneys? I don't know, but we can try. You know, there's a triple herb combination. Is this person in the U.S. or are they in Canada? Do you know? Pete, can you tell us where this person is? And unmute for us. Pete Bit Burrito. So if they're US, we have a lot more options when there's Canada. It's amazing what you can and can't get there. So. Kat asks, Shark Tank, Dr. Oz, they have all these miracle weight loss pills and the ads that keep popping up on social media. Can you speak to the outrageous weight loss claims they're making? I think you just did, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, the biggest products that have caused problems in the natural product industry and for sellers and consumers have been weight loss products. You know, either they're laced with amphetamines or something like that. And, you know, people end up having cardiac arrest and, and there is no miracle in a pill. You know, there's no something for nothing. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know how they even get away with advertising some of the things that they are. But the first question to ask to be asked is what's causing the problem? And then can we get after cause and effect and unwind it with sensible diet, exercise, stress management, eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right. Uh, and we do that, we're going to be okay. Perfect. Xavier asks, can you expand on uh, regional fat? Yeah. And in fact, maybe we'll do that at some time. But so I, uh, I've taught all over the world and I, I've interestingly enough, been asked to lecture for some amazing people. And so there was the guy that claimed to be the world's most successful strength and conditioning coach. His name's Charles Poliquin. Uh, and Charles Poliquin had trained people that won Olympic medals in 17 different sports. So he's a very good strength and conditioning trainer. Sadly, he died, I think it was about three years ago. He just happened to have a heart attack in his kitchen and game over. Um, but Charles had been to my seminars years ago. He said, Bob, I really like the way you teach. I have a system called biosignature. And what we do is we look at different sites of the body where fat is accumulating. And I'm beginning to match this to different hormone patterns based on blood tests and other tests. And so I dug into his material really deep and I created a seminar series called the, or at least a seminar day called the Endocrine Fat Connection. Uh, and we know that regional fat distribution is under endocrine control or hormone control. And therefore it gives you a clue as to which hormones are most out of balance in your system. And maybe we'll even do that on, uh, on an Ask the Doctor. That might be fun. Um, yeah, when I do a full day, I get deep into endocrinology, but a lot of people probably want to know if I'm fat here, what does that mean? If I'm fat there, what does that mean? If I'm fat here, what does that mean? And what do we do about it? Great. So, Laurel just heard of a zeolite detox supposed to bind to metals on the body and flush. How does this, how does organo gold work like that or in conjunction with it? Well, zeolite's going to bind it in the colon and not just metals. It's going to bind a lot of stuff. You're not going to infuse that in the veins. You're going to swallow it. It's going to stay in the, the colon. It's going to bind gut toxins. And so, you know, there's probably better things in both of those for heavy metal toxins. And, and so the body makes something called metallothionine proteins. Uh, and these are things that are very, very zinc dependent. And in fact, that's why so many people are zinc deficient. But one of the professional nutraceutical companies that I work for, you know, had a two year project known as proteomic research. And they created a product called metalloclear where they could increase your body's own production of metallothionine protein 40X in two weeks. And I've used that very effectively for heavy metal clearance. So there's lots of ways to clear metals. Sometimes people will go for infusions. They'll have things put in their veins like EDT, uh, EDTA, 
DMSA, DMPS, but these don't just grab heavy metals. They also grab nutritive elements. And a bigger problem is they don't cross the blood brain barrier where metals can be really, really bad. But the metallothionine proteins can clear metals and selectively only metals out of anywhere in the body that blood flow goes. So that's my uh, uh, primary way of doing that. Sometimes we throw in some heavy chelators for people that are very, very toxic, but usually the metallothionine protein approach works best. Thank you, Dr. Bob. And Pete was saying that his friend was in Canada. Yeah, harder to get them good stuff. So I'm not, I don't know if he's connected to Diane. Diane knows what nutrients are available uh, and we can try to figure it out. But, you know, if he's got out of control diabetes, we need to fix that. We need to get him everything for his kidneys. It sounds like we need to get it yesterday. So it'd probably be good for him to connect with Diane. Okay. Beatrice asks uh, if you can speak to what you think of a coffee enema. Well, I think they're awesome. And so maybe I have the book here, it might be in my office, but there's a book called Wellness Against All Odds. And this was a, a early edition of, of basically people beating cancer when they weren't supposed to. The latest book on that is called Radical Remission. But at any rate, when people put coffee in their backside, there's a, a network of veins that goes directly to the liver. It's called the portal plexus. And it was said that the primary job of the liver was to actually detoxify the bowel before all these toxins came into our environment. So when you put coffee in your backside, it goes to the liver and it causes liver to bump, uh, dump bile and toxins. So I have a, a fun VIP patient <clears throat> who uh, I put on a detox uh, and she you know, had a horrible migraine headache, which can happen with detox. And as part of it, she was doing, you know, Ganoderma infused coffee, king of coffee uh, to help her detox. And I said, well, I know this might sound strange, but I'm going to suggest that you do a coffee enema. And, <clears throat> you know, she thought this was the strangest thing that she had ever heard. And I said, I know it sounds strange. You can look it up on YouTube. There's good science behind that. I've recommended it for a lot of patients. I'm going to suggest you try it. Let's see what happens. Well, she did it. And as soon as she eliminated her headache was gone. And then she called me back. She said, my headache's gone. Can my husband do that? And so why not? Right. So they're very effective. Okay. Grace uh, asks, um, what do you, what do you do about stomach bleeding and what do you think, what can it be from? We've got to find that out. It could be an ulcer. It could be cancer. How do you know it's stomach bleeding? You know, it could be esophageal. <clears throat> could be an infection. If there's a lot, I go to the emergency room. You know, normally an ulcer hurts bad. And if you get an ulcer that's bleeding, it could be on the edge of being very dangerous. So, you know, drink a big glass of water, maybe some baking soda, get it checked out by a doctor. Okay. Uh, what causes brain fog and how long would it take for mycelium to receive, to relieve it? Well, generally that's some type of intoxication of the brain and they often associate with yeast and fungus and die off and things like that. And so we wanna get rid of all the yeast and fungus and how long would that take? It depends on how bad the case is. Could mycelium help it potentially, but you wanna starve the yeast and fungus. So that's no starches, no simple sugars, a ketogenic diet, lots of Ganoderma, other things like that. Uh, and you know, Eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right. Okay. Um, Laurel asked, was asking what the name again was, metal, metallothymine? Yeah, I'm going to type it here. Because um, it's, there's the word metallothionine, and the product is metalloclear from Metagenics. <clears throat> Perfect. All right, got another question for you coming right up. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, so Grace has a friend. Her name is Tundi. I believe I said that right, I hope. Um, she feels that she had a stroke because she took the Pfizer shot. What can she do to get rid of 
what's in her body and she does not want to take the second dose, obviously. Um, I think I'm now getting multiple calls every single day asking this same question. And uh, at some point, there has to be free speech and we're not there yet. Uh, and I, I don't understand that at all. But, you know, scientists all over the world are trying to figure out how we do that. So what they've done is they've put a gene therapy in your body. Your body's genetics, your cells are now making spike proteins. And, you know, they have medical examiners that have done autopsies on people that died after that. And they're saying every organ has spike proteins. And this, this one gentleman was, was livid. He says, why is this information being suppressed? Why did they wait so long to do an autopsy? Um, you know, the world needs to know. And so, you know, I, I've got a, a new patient coming in tomorrow morning with the same question. You know, some people are saying that, you know, maybe some, some type of pine extract essential oil could neutralize it. Other people are saying glutathione. Here's what I'm gonna say. Your genes are now making spike proteins. Your body probably has to kill every cell that's making spike proteins. Uh, and otherwise you're gonna keep making them. Now, can you do that without wreaking havoc on your body, mind, and spirit? That's a good question because they're finding it in the brain, in the heart, in the kidneys, in the liver. So this is, uh, <clears throat> this is not noble in any way. Okay. Um, are there foods that keep us oxygenated? Well, I'm going to answer that a little bit differently. So oxygen transfer is dependent upon a lot of things and, and especially the acid alkaline level within the blood. And you want to be near your ideal level of pH and your lungs need to work. So, you know, do foods have oxygen in them? very, very, very minimally, you know, they used to sell oxygenated water and I would tell people, okay, you could, you could spend $5 for a gallon of oxygenated water. You could drink it all over the course of the day, but you would get more oxygen if you just did this and took a deep breath. And, and so, you know, it was just kind of hype, but ultimately oxygen is going to come in through the lungs. It's going to bind a hemoglobin as long as you have good blood and good iron status, it's gonna to circulate to the tissues and it's gonna be delivered to tissues that need the oxygen. Uh, and you know, can foods help that? I guess in some ways, when you have something that has nitrate and Ganoderma has that, nitrate can become nitric oxide, it can dilate tissues. Uh, it also modulates inflammation, which is a, something that steals nitric oxide. And so, you know, a good, clean, anti-inflammatory, low glycemic index, phytonutrient-dense diet would probably be that diet that would improve oxygenation. Perfect. Our friend from across the pond, Nicole, has another question. And I just lost it. One second. Um, what can be done about a metallic taste or burnt taste in the mouth and where does it come from? So <clears throat> there's a lot of people that relate that to heavy metal toxicity, quite simply. Uh, and so what we were talking about with the metalloclear, creating the metallothionine proteins that can help. So detox, heavy metal detox. Perfect. Xavius would like to know if you can go into and explain for us what the spiked protein is. So yes. So there's, be this, awesome. there's this virus that we're not gonna name that's been getting a lot of press. And so the virus is going to maybe look like a ball and it's got a ton of spikes coming through it. So I'm trying to figure out how I can draw a spike, but just spike, 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 spike. Well, what they decided to do was to create uh, a genetic message that they inject into people as part of a science experiment, which by the way, has not been approved and does not meet the criteria of vaccine and they actually turn their cells genetic material on. They, they do genetic modification to the humans. And so now humans are making this viral spike protein. Uh, and what they're trying to say is they think that they'll have a better chance at not getting this virus or beating this virus, but it's not turning out that way. You know, um, when we still had free press and free speech, 
they've suddenly reported in Massachusetts, 75% of people that were being diagnosed with the infection had received the jab. Um, you know, my parents are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they're both 80. And I have families in medicine that are trying to tell them, oh, you, you know, you should get that. My parents say, that sounds ridiculous. Why would I do that? Well, they follow baseball. Uh, the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team, the professional team there, nine of their players all came up with the virus and they had all received the jab. So how protective is it? Not very, you know, and I know of three people that died from the jab. Uh, not within three days, but two weeks, five weeks, and six weeks. Uh, and one case was very tragic. It was the brother-in-law of a patient of mine. She came in very upset. Uh, her sister-in-law, and by the way, it's her both sister-in-law and brother-in-law because her sister-in-law was married to her husband who passed. So, um, but at any rate, um, she said, I lost my brother-in-law this week. And I said, what's going on? She says he had the jab two weeks ago, took the dog for a walk and never came back. She says, wife refused autopsy. Uh, and I think it's because she feels guilty because he didn't want it and she talked him into it. Well, now she's in an insane asylum. She lost her mind. So, you know, imagine that you led your, your loved one down a path of destruction. And just like that, they didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it. Okay, honey, for you, I will. Two weeks later, they're dead. Uh, and these stories are, if we had freedom of speech, we'd probably have more of those than, than we could ever see. It's just getting ridiculous. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Xavius uh, was just clarifying the uh, oxygenation. So, so regular deep breathing and heavy uh, exercise helps to, uh, keep and increase the body's oxygenation. That would be correct, yep. Carol, you're muted. That helps. Um, just checking to see if I had any more messages because I've got a few from here. Okay. Um, can a bad liver cause dry mouth? Well, when you say can, you always have to go in that realm of possibility, right? And, and so ultimately what we tell people is the solution of pollution is dilution. If the liver is not clearing the toxins effectively, then the body will hold more water outside of the cell. So it draws water from inside the cell. Could that ultimately lead to dry mouth? Yeah, it could. I could see where it would. Excellent. Now, are there any other questions yet, my friends? Because this has been a really good session with lots of new information tonight. I think each week is getting better, right, Claudio? And welcome back, Claudio. <laughs> I, I, you know what, I just so appreciate the new information. I find it all invaluable and it just, you know, extremely helpful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love, love, love. Love you back. All right, how can you test if you are allergic to copper? Well, they generally suggest that allergies are protein phenomena. So it may not be that copper would be an allergy, but it could be a sensitivity. It could be a toxicity. Uh, and there's copper storage diseases and you know something called Wilson's disease, which is problematic. There's people that sometimes they put on copper bracelets and they, you know, they get some greenish. That's probably not an ideal reaction. Uh, but zinc is what chelates copper. And we have a, a pretty strong level of zinc deficiency around the globe. So if you feel sensitive to copper, avoid it and increase your zinc. Right, we're getting a lot of thank yous. And then Xavier has asked if there are any plant-based collagens that you could recommend. Well, that's a good question. I don't know if they're plant-based or not. You know, I, I use some, you know, professional nutraceutical companies and I thought they were all animal-based. I don't know that there's a plant-based, but I can, I can check a little deeper into that. Awesome. All right. So Beatrice says all the pipes in her house are copper. Okay. We might want to have the water tested. You certainly want to get extra zinc. What is happening when a person wears silver and it changes color? It's going to be some type of reaction with their chemistry is about the best I can tell you, you know? 
and we all have unique chemistry. That's the fascinating thing. I mean, every one of us is going to be just slightly different. Uh, and if it doesn't agree with you, you might not want to do it. But the interesting thing about silver is it's got antimicrobial properties. You know, so there's there's people that, you know, for years have done different types of colloidal silver uh, as ways of killing infection, but you can certainly get too much of it. So we don't do much with that. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Are there any other final questions before we thank the man of the hour? Going, going. All right, guys, time to unmute and say thank you to the most amazing uh, coach we have. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Yes. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bob. 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 Thank you, Dr. Bob.